Hello, welcome to another episode of GradCast. We're really excited to have you with us. My name is Yiman Chan. I'll be one of your hosts today. And joining me as co-host is my good buddy, Yusuf. How are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Oh, awesome. So we have a uh, guest that I've been looking forward to quite a bit on today. Uh, she's also one of the members of the GradCast committee, Nicole Posnov. How are you doing? No, it feels so weird being on the other end of this. <laughs> Usually I'm so just <laughs> used to <laughs> hosting. <laughs> Well, you know, we're, uh, we may be friends, but I'm not going to pull any punches. This is going to be a hard hitting, you know, rapid fire question asking show. Uh -oh. And uh, my first question is, um, I mean, over the years, we haven't really talked that much about like your research sort of personally, but I understand um, your studies are related to life on Mars. Yep, um, it sure is. So, <laughs> so can you tell us a bit more about that and, you know, where, what's, what's sort of department, what sort of faculty at Western studies that kind of cool thing? Like so life on Mars? <laughs> yeah, so life on mm. Mars. But the, so it, it was kind of a weird way of getting into this field because Western doesn't, well, didn't actually have this type of research when I was starting. Um, mm -hmm. So I had to get my way into geology because the ge they're the only person that I found that was studying anything relatively similar to like extraterrestrial life was this guy Gordon Osinski in geology, and he was there's also like the planetary science and space exploration minor in like your undergrad which he was kind of like running at the time, so that's how I found him and then I had to find another supervisor and she would be like my bi biology supervisor kind of that so I could do like the geobiology and then tie it all together to space. So there's there was a lot of just trying to figure things out. Technically I'm in the geology program but I have a supervisor in Georgetown University in Washington DC and she's in astrobiology but she calls herself a microbiologist so that's kind of where all my supervision comes from i guess <laughs> wow i mean i guess a lot is happening so tell us more about what it means to be a geo microbiologist that's a huge i mean i know biology a little bit but geo microbiologist what's that about yeah so i uh, so i did my undergrad in microbiology and immunology so i've always kind of really liked um microbes viruses bacteria that's always kind of been what fascinates me and so I knew I wanted to study microorganisms ah, okay. and then kind of tying that into geology so uh, and planetary science, because realistically, if we were to find any life on any extraterrestrial planet, it would be microorganisms. So then I study them in geology because there's geology on every planet. And I can go more into details about exactly what kind of geology I've studied them in. But then I study these geo microorganisms in a planetary like setting <laughs> okay i mean please do uh go into more detail as to how you study these geo microorganisms <laughs> so okay so when you're trying to find a way to study microorganisms that would be likely to be found on mars you there's not a lot of ways to do that on earth because earth is so different from mars so uh, there are people who are like there are people suggesting that maybe hydrothermal vents and like in the deep ocean that may be like potential analog systems like systems are most like Mars that we can use to study it but my supervisor is actually very um, he supports the idea more of impact craters because impact events happen everywhere and they might not be very common on earth but they're super common on the moon on Mars and you can really see that just by like looking at the moon you can see hundreds thousands of craters just like with the naked eye and same thing on mars there's lots of craters there and the idea of using a crater as an analog is that it is a perfect kind of habitat to spark life so if you think about what life needs like even here on earth it needs energy it needs water it needs a place to live so with this impact events uh when the impact hits the subsurface that's the energy part of it then it creates and like also the heat and the pressure kind of also sparks the energy. And then if there's water in the subsurface, it brings it up so that these 
like life can kind of use that as nutrients. And then it also creates pores in the rocks. So that's kind of the places that they can crawl into and hide from Mars's horrible conditions. You know, okay, cool? I mean, that sounds like mind blowing to me because, you know, when I hear about crater and life, it's the first thing I think about is how they end life. You know, I, I think about the, the, the impact that wiped out the dinosaurs. But, you know, the, the way you're talking about it, it's a sort of environment that helps, I don't know, like incubate or promotes um, at yeah. least like a simple microbial life. So it's definitely a devastating event when it first happens, if there's any life there. <laughs> so okay. that's kind of, yeah. So the entire theory is assuming that, yeah, it might have wiped out anything that was there, but it did provide, if, if it wiped out everything that was there, it kind of also after the its temperature decreases a bit, there's less pressure. Once everything kind of calms down, it's a perfect spot for life to start again. You know, Nicole, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to see craters the way I normally did. I mean, they have a whole new meaning to me. I never thought of them as life possible, possibly life givers. So, wow, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, and how come you got interested in uh, knowing more about the possibility of there being life on Mars in particular? Why Mars? Is that a coincidence given the kinds of uh, materials you're working on? Uh, so Mars has always been, has always had a spot in my heart. I've always loved Mars, but uh, yeah, I mean, I understand there's a lot of people who are looking more into the like watery moons uh, as potential places for life. But I particularly like Mars because it's a realistic goal to look for life there. Uh, whereas like maybe places like Europa and stuff like, yeah, they have, water there and they have like literally it's like splashing out of the surface and there's all these good like fat like things that would suggest that yeah maybe there's life there but i'm really particularly focused on mars because we already have we we know a lot about mars we know we can get there and we have rovers that are going up there and doing life detection missions so if i was to stick in the field and graduate soon and get a job maybe with CSA, ESA, NASA, whatever, uh, then I would possibly be working on these sample return um, type of rocks and looking for it to extract life and DNA out of there if there's anything there. But So kind of just like looking out for myself a little bit in the way, but I do think Mars is the place we should be looking at first because that is the most realistic place that we can actually get to. Well, I, I hope that some people out there are listening to you very carefully. Her name is Nicole Poznoff, if anyone wants to know. Brad Cass is the area. Hi, uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, speaking of samples, you're talking about getting stuff from Mars. Um, does that mean you are not working with Martian samples right now? No, so I, I wish. <laughs> I, the, the very few people out there that are, I'm so jealous of, but... Um, no, I'm working with, um, so kind of, I guess, going back to what I was talking about, how there are not a lot of places on Earth that you can use as direct analogs from Mars. There are uh, six craters on Earth that we currently know of that are in the exact same lithology, so the same rock type as Mars is fully covered in, mm -hmm. and, um, and we can actually get access to to study them. So there's three in Brazil. There's oh. one in Russia, one in India. Oh. How many is that? That's five. Uh, where's this? Where's and then another sixth one was recently discovered somewhere in Africa, but I'm not exactly sure where. But um, it is really, really new. It's like, I think, a last year paper. But uh, basically, I got lucky enough to work with samples from Brazil, from two of the three craters in Brazil. And one of my supervisors, actually, the one that's in Georgetown, she collected them herself in oh, 2017. Wow. And yeah, and they were stored on ice and uh, until she finally got a student to work on them, which was me. And I was able to use her samples uh, to do all of the, the geology and the biology on them. So, so do you get to travel here and there to do your research? Uh, and I, where do... Unfortunately, I didn't get to go to Brazil to collect my samples, which was... <laughs> oh, I not wish yet, I could. not yet, right? 
I know. I keep like uh, sending, telling them I need more, and I'm like, we should plan another trip for more sample collection. <laughs> and COVID obviously hit. But uh, yeah, I did get to go to the states to Georgetown and work with my supervisor there uh, for some time until COVID started, and then I had to come back. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, when you're analyzing these samples, what are you doing to them? How are you, you know, how are you doing your analysis and what are you looking for? So um, and this, the first thing I had to do was just classify what my shocked impact samples were. So there's not a lot of work that's been done on these two Brazilian impact craters. They're called Varjeo Dome and Vista Alegre. And so I had to take my samples first and classify their shock level. So when I'm talking about shock level, it's basically, so if there is the meteor hits uh, like for the bedrock, and then obviously in the very center and the closest to where it hit is gonna be the most shock. That's where the most temperature, the most pressure is. And then as you move out and out throughout the diameter of the crater, there's gonna be less and less shock. Shock directly correlates to the porosity of the rock. I mean, the very, very closest ones, it's so porous to the point where it kind of collapses onto itself and melts. So that's not really interesting to us, but kind of slight, kind of in the center, not the very farthest of the crater, not the most center, but like the middle radius kind of, that's where the best shock is to support life. So that would be like, it's different, depends on every lithology, but probably around shock three, maybe. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> but something like that is what you would want to look for. So that would be porous enough that they can sneak into, but not so porous that it collapses onto itself. So first thing I had to do with my samples is classify their shock level and classify their porosity. So I knew the exact porosity and the shock level of all of my rocks because the my supervisor collected them at different distances from the epicenter so that they would be a big variety of different samples that I had. So that was kind of step one. Then I had to classify their hydrothermal alteration. So like Mars, the craters that I've been working with also have subsurface, a hydrothermal system in the subsurface. So um, they were, when the impact happened, the water also altered a lot of the rocks. So this is really important because it provides new clays and zeolites. So th those are just types of things that are found in rocks that have been exposed to water, but they're important because they provide nutrients for microorganisms. So there's like a lot of studies that have shown that micro the microorganisms utilize these clays and zeolites and literally take things out of them and feed on them and survive on them. So I was classifying exactly what types of clays, what type of zeolites were in these rocks. So now that I knew their hydrothermal alteration state and their shock state, that's when I started extracting different DNA and culturing them to see which shock level, which hydrothermal level had the most amount of um, microorganisms, the most, maybe the, the diversity of the microorganisms. And based on that, so that's the work, that's kind of where I stopped because that's when COVID hit. So, but once I get all my sequencing data back, that's when I'm gonna classify where, yeah. what hydrothermal alteration and what shock level is best to host life, I guess. Wow. And <laughs> Could you tell us how much time it takes to extract DNA and do sequencing and, and so on and so forth? What's that like? So that was a time consuming part because, uh, well, there's not a lot of protocols for how to extract DNA out of samples that have clays in them. So they're very difficult samples to extract DNA out of because clay clings or DNA clings to clay so it's very hard to separate it without completely breaking it apart so there was a lot of trials that I had to do on like old expired DNA kits to actually like figure out the perfect protocol like how much of each type of enzyme I need to put in there and how much like how long to spin things and just there was a lot of time that went into that but then once I figured out the best way to extract my type of um, DNA from my type of samples it was not that long. I was able to do like maybe six, eight at a time. And then I was like flying through them. But 
they are currently frozen in Georgetown University. <laughs> and so hopefully as soon as their labs and all the facilities open, they'll be sent out for sequencing. But I also have all of my samples. They're sitting in little beakers and culturing right now too. So I have no idea what's going on over there because they were just kind of left in the lab when everything shut down. So they might be taking over the lab, who knows? <laughs> all these extremophilic bacteria just hanging out in little beakers, but we'll see. <laughs> So correct me if I'm wrong, um, if I understand this correctly, you're looking at these impact craters at different sites among the craters and so on, um, trying to find evidence of what sort of environments they might have been and which are the best ones that could possibly support life. Yeah. yeah. Um, so based on, you know, what you found, can you tell us a little bit, describe like what would this environment look like in terms of like what, what would the features be to support life? So mm -hmm. definitely we would have to drill in the subsurface because we know Martian conditions are horrible for any life to survive on. So they would definitely have to be in the subsurface. Mm -hmm. Then, like I said, a proc I'm based on like my preliminary data just on, and then like the porosity and all the data that I do know, I would say probably shock level three has been uh, a good shock level to support life. And then, but that doesn't mean that shock level two or four can't. That just means that that has been the one that shows the most and the most diversity of life too. And then um, just uh, certain types of clays, like any clays and zeolites really, I feel like the more, the better they're, the, like the more clays and zeolites there are, the more they can like extract whatever they want out of it. I don't know if particularly what microorganisms are gonna be found on Mars. So I can't really tell you exactly what clays are gonna be the best for them to utilize, but just kind of the more hydrothermal, the better. So very hydrothermally altered shock level three and in the subsurface. So that's gonna be different depending on the size of the crater. So with mathematical calculations, like we do know how to calculate approximately what the pressure is based on the size of the crater at certain distances. So it's like we can, for example, like on earth, like if my crater, for example, is 12.9 kilometers in diameter, and then a crater on Mars is like 300 kilometers in diameter. And we know like three kilometers from the epicenter is this much pressure, this much temperature, which resulted in this shock level. We can directly correlate that to uh, impact crater on Mars and say, this many kilometers from the epicenter is that shock level. So we should start looking there because realistically, when we send a rover up there, uh, it's not going to be able to check the entire 300 kilometer dam or like that's just not realistic. So we want to send it to where life is most likely to be found. I'm not saying that there's going to be living life there, but hopefully uh, they can even find even I have signatures of previously existing life in these rocks, and hopefully it would be in the spots that I'm suggesting. <laughs> wow. I, I was wondering, I mean, I, when I read your abstract, your research, and it, it was really fascinating. So I was just wondering how people whom you get in touch with for the first time or some family members as well, when they ask you, what are you doing? Uh, do you focus more on the geomicrobiology part or do you talk more about the 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 life part in Mars? <laughs> I mean, the aliens part is a lot more exciting to talk <laughs> aliens. about. Aliens. <laughs> so that's generally what I tell people. I'm like, yeah, I, I study astrobiology because geomicrobiology just is a whole can of worms. And I have to explain that. So I just stick to astrobiology. And then I say, yeah, I look for habitable places on Mars, like where we should look for life on Mars. And that's just kind of my <laughs> 10 second way of explaining what I study. <laughs> do they also ask you about movies uh, and say, well, what do you think about this movie depiction? Is it accurate from yeah. your PhD? <laughs> I mean, they have to make movies exciting, right? So like, it's completely understandable <laughs> that they exaggerate everything, but no, I- It's all real stuff. No, there are a lot of realistic um, things in a lot of the yeah. movies, though. Yeah, is is there um, any particular movie that you can think of that, you know, scientifically does a good job of, um, you know, showing what alien life might actually be like or, you know, captures the environment or the circumstances or the study of this fairly well? Uh, I really liked The Martian with regards to how he like grew his own, 
I don't want to spoil anything for anybody, but like how he grew his own crops and everything, but that didn't really touch on life at all there. Um, most movies, like how, how do you show microorganisms and make it seem exciting? Like you can't really like zoom in like, oh, look, this rock might have some microorganisms. We should take it back to earth and look at it. Like it's not yeah. very exciting for movies. So they definitely make it like something you can see with the naked eye. Kind of like the really max kind of like the macro version of those micro stuff as well uh when it comes to aliens um yeah, yeah I, <laughs> there's Nick... floating single singular cellular organisms <laughs> like... i was wondering um so you came here before you did it you were a guest here before as well and i'm sure your research evolved a lot as it happens to all of us we begin with an abstract and we end up with something completely different and we have to revise the abstract so tell us about your journey from your fir the first time you were a guest here on Gat Gatcast and what you discussed and how you feel about it now. Yeah, so if anyone's interested, it's episode 210. That was my first episode. <laughs> so go check it out. It kind of talks about what I thought I was going to be doing. <laughs> I, a lot of it is correct. Like I, a lot of the stuff I actually did end up doing. Um, but one thing that I wish I could have gotten more into, which I didn't get a chance to, is the this idea of a Mars box. So I was hoping that I would have enough time at the end to also get a Mars box. So um, my supervisor works closely with another supervisor from the University of Winnipeg, and they build Mars boxes, which are basically boxes that simulate the temperature, pressure, um, the atmosphere, basically all the conditions that Mars would be in. So what I was hoping to do is, so after I extracted DNA, figured out exactly what's in my rocks, I would completely autoclave them, which means just clean them out of anything that's living, um, and then put some of them in Earth-like conditions, and then some of them in this Mars box, and take my own microorganisms that are extremophiles, like I would order some in, and then put them particularly in both environments and see if they even survived in Martian conditions. Because I feel like that is kind of what would tie my entire project together. Because if all these organisms that I'm looking at, like they can only grow in terrestrial conditions, like, yeah, they might be extreme files for earth, but like, are they extreme enough to survive on Mars? So, like the, I was hoping to be able to test that out at the end, but didn't have enough time. My supervisor keeps saying I should do a PhD and do it, but Maybe if there's somebody else out there that wants to take on my project, <laughs> but I feel like that would have been really fun to do and really cool. And I was talking about that in the first episode that I was in and how I was super excited about the Mars box idea, but maybe, maybe in the PhD. <laughs> well, sort of on that note, um, I remember not too long ago hearing uh, like a news report about the discovery of you know, signs of life or organic particles or something in, in, in the atmosphere of Venus. And you mentioned, you know, some of the icy moons in the solar system as well. Um, where do you think is, you know, the most likely place that we will first encounter extraterrestrial life? And, and do you think, you know, it'll be anytime soon? Um, so the whole thing with Venus, uh, I, it's so frustrating. They found phosphorus on Venus. And then they say, oh, we found phosphorus, which means there's life on Venus. No, it doesn't mean anything like that. It's just something that is necessary for life on Earth, but or is part of life on Earth. It doesn't mean that they found life on Venus. So don't believe any of that. Yes, it's super <laughs> exciting. It's it's an amazing discovery. Yes, everyone should be like looking into that further, but it doesn't mean that there's life on Venus. But with regards to where life is most likely to be found, uh, I mean, as much as I want it to be on Mars, I don't think that there's anything living on Mars. I think that if we find anything, it'll be what I think we will. I'm not, like, I can't promise it, but I think we will find evidence of previous life on Mars. With regards to, and that will be soon because we have the rovers that are so going 2021, I think. That's when they're, they keep pushing it back. It was supposed to be 2020 and then now it's 2021, but they're happening and they do have an entire sample collection box and things that are going to be returning to Earth with regards to looking for life. And they know exactly the type of instruments they need to use to detect evidence of life. And there's a lot more research now that they can use. But so I think that'll be very soon, probably in the next 
I don't know, five years or so, we'll have good enough data to be able to say if there's previously existing life on Mars. I confidently say that. And hopefully wow. the answer will be yes and not no, because then otherwise I have to find a new favorite planet. But with <laughs> regards to living life, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's a tough question. I don't know if we in our lifetime we'll be able to find living life because if there's anything I, it's hard to say i mean how did we not already find it but i, don't know. Did... I, I Sorry, wonder i wonder if you saw the recent uh the weird monolith found in utah and then sort of disappeared i don't know maybe we might find new life forms emerging soon i mean 2020 finale Aliens? <laughs> Come on, that's 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 got to be the case. I think it's not all we no need. zombie apocalypse. Exactly, <laughs> that's all else. that's missing from this hell of a year. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, all right. I well, was... here's a, a very important question: uh, What is your favorite fictional alien? Film, movies, you know, TV, whatever. <laughs> oh man, I don't know. Um. I don't know. Have you guys seen The Expanse? I haven't. I know of it. Oh my god, it's so good. I definitely it recommend it. The Expanse. the Expanse. It's a show and it's amazing. It is absolutely like my one of my favorite shows and they're releasing a new season soon. So definitely everybody watch it and catch up on it. But there is like this almost like similar to COVID kind of, but there was just like this virus not virus but like this microorganism that's like taking over a bunch of things and it's like using the power of the sun to survive and it, this is all like in outer space and I feel like that was the most realistic alien that could be but this alien is just killing everything out there and it's just like super powerful and it's like growing from the sun and like and it, it was like they didn't even know about it until they they brought they like um, contaminated their spaceship and brought it back, but like I, I like that aliens the best because it's Excise. not like a green I thing. Yeah. I should have known your favorite would be a microorganism. Uh, can yes. I just ask a quick question because I know the time we're almost running out of time. Nicole, uh, so you were you have been the gradcast host. Uh, can you just tell us what that felt like? What you've learned? Yeah, I, I love Gradcast. I, I wish I could be on this forever. <laughs> like, this has been, yeah, I love you guys. <laughs> this has been the most amazing experience. And yeah, I'm submitting my thesis and finishing up, but like, I'm not going to stop listening to this, like, no matter what. Like, this has been so exciting and fun. Like, every time I post or I host and interview a new guest, I always learn something new. There's never mm. been one time where I didn't learn something new. And just like, it's it's so cool to learn about other things. Like how else am I gonna go and talk to other random students about yeah. their research? Like this is the perfect yeah. way to do it. So I think that's my favorite part. Wow, awesome. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you, very, thank you so much. <laughs> um, so as we approach the end here, um, did you wanna give a shout out to any social media account that you would like people to follow you on? Uh, yeah, uh, so my Twitter handle is Space Dr. Nick. <laughs> so S P A C E D O T O R D O C T O R, and then just N I K. So just how you think it would be spelled. And then um, my supervisor has a really cool Insta uh, Twitter too that you guys, everyone should follow. His name is Gordon Osinski. Uh, ooh, can't tell you what his Twitter handle is, but if you, you'll find him, he's really we'll well known in the, in the field. Yeah. He's very known in the field and he tweets the coolest stuff about space and geology and everything life related. So he's definitely a good person to follow on Twitter too. Okay. Well, Nicole, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today on Gradcast and, you. you know, all the best in your future pursuits for extraterrestrial life. Um, you know, fingers crossed for you to visit Mars within your I'd life. I'd love oh. to be an astronaut too. <laughs> That's a whole other episode though. Uh, third episode, uh, you should be here <laughs> soon. When I become an astronaut. <laughs> uh, we'd love to have you back in that case then. <laughs> but uh, until then, uh, this has been Gradcast uh, with your host, Yimin Chen, that's me. 
uh, Yusuf Hassan, and our guest today was Nicole Poznov. The committee member. <laughs> That's right, Nicole Poznov. Thank you very much. Gradcast is a production of the Society of Graduate Students at the University of Western Ontario. You can find us uh, on Spotify, YouTube, Radio Western, and wherever fine podcasts can be subscribed to. Uh, also visit our website at gradcast.ca. And if you'd like to be on the show, if you'd like to join the committee and get involved or just be a guest, um, drop us a line. Our email is gradcastradio at gmail.com. Until next time. Uh, to infinity and beyond. Cool, all you cats on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. I like it. <laughs>